Um, all right, so I'm really pleased to introduce you um, to her. I'm going to make it quick because I want to hear her talk. Uh, LB is the director of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. Her work Justice program. Justice program. I'm My sorry. boss would be upset if I was <laughs> <That's> to you. <laughs> Thank you. I said, I said, I said, please correct me because I'm taking all this out of emails. They can't other people. Uh, her work focuses on improving the criminal justice process, including issues surrounding mass incarceration. And add whatever you like to that. She's the author of several nationally recognized reports and articles on how to reduce America's reliance on incarceration. Her work has been featured in media outlets across the country, including the New York Times, USA Today, Time, you gotta take a break, there's a lot, US News and World Report, The Daily News and The Marshall Project. She's appeared uh, on MSNBC, CNN, CBS News, NBC News, Fox News, NPR, and, and many other shows that you're, you're aware of. Um, LB is the author of Inside Private Prisons and America's Dilemma in the Age of Mass Incarceration and is a Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting Journalism grantee. I hope I said that right. There you go. Uh, in 2020, she became a founding member of the Council on Criminal Justice, which works to advance understanding of the criminal justice policy choices facing the nation and to build consensus for solutions to enhance safety and justice. I could go on, but I want you to, because it did a lot more, but let, let's welcome her. And I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you this week. I understand exams that are coming up pretty quickly, so appreciate all of you um, taking time out today to uh, listen to this conversation. And thank you um, to the University of Richmond and you know, everyone who invited me here at the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting for making it possible for me to be here. Uh, I am going to talk for about 35 minutes or so, and then would love to open it up for questions. And you can ask questions that are much broader than what this talk is about as well. Uh, so I am, I direct the justice program at the Brennan Center for Justice. We are a team that focuses on reducing our reliance on unnecessary incarceration. So we do that through uh, research reports, policy proposals, state and federal advocacy. A lot of our work is about educating the broader public. Uh, so one of our um, ways of, that we think we can make impact to reduce our nation's reliance on incarceration is by speaking out in the media and speaking to groups that may not um, have as much sort of understanding or um, proximity to our nation's jails and prisons and may not be aware of the many harms that mass incarceration in the United States has wrought on our communities. So today I'm going to just start with a few basic slides so that you have context for incarceration rates in the United States, and then I'm going to move over to some of the research that um, I have done specifically in New Zealand and in Australia, looking at new contracts with private prison companies. So just a little, just for a little context, um, this is, this chart shows changes in U.S. prison populations from 1970 to 2020. The reason why this stops in 2020 is just because of the Government Bureau of Justice Statistics data that stops in 2020. Um, we do know that there was a continued decrease from 2020 to 2021 uh, in most prisons nationwide due to the COVID pandemic. And we did see a significant decrease in prison populations um, during COVID, about 15% reduction. And a lot of that was because of um, decisions that were made not to send people back to prison for technical violations of their probation or paroles, which is not showing up for drug treatment, um, just because departments of corrections, probation officers couldn't really keep track of that anymore, and they weren't, and they also didn't want to send people to prison where we knew that there were significant public health risks. So many of you probably know that the U.S. is the world's number one incarcerator. Uh, this is a statistic that I'm guessing all of you in the room know, uh, but it's worth repeating that the United States holds 
five percent, a little, a little under five percent of the world's people, and almost twenty-five percent of the world's incarcerated population. So we incarcerate um, at a, a huge rate, and that's why we use the phrase mass incarceration, um, because the numbers are just astounding. Um, right now, we have about 1.2 million people in state and federal prisons. So the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, has about 150,000 people right now, which is which is pretty low for them. <coughs> and the rest of the people in our prison system are in state prisons all across the country. And if we took a snapshot today, as we're having this conversation, of the number of people in our county jails, there'd be about 700,000 people. Uh, you might have heard this statistic that the U.S. has about 10 million or more admissions into county jail every year. It's a really important statistic in understanding our jail populations. Many of those people are the same people in who are being um, admitted into our jails over and over. We don't have a statistic of sort of unique individuals. Um, but that's important because it shows you that the churn of people who are going into jail, being released, going to jail, being released. And when we talk about public health issues, and certainly COVID was a very significant issue in our jails and our prisons, um, we, that's an important statistic because it shows us the connection to our communities. You know, people always say our jails, our prisons are out of sight and out of mind. But when you have that churn, you're releasing people back into the community who um, you know, are, are spreading disease, and we're not taking care of those people when they're in our jails. Uh, so that is a very significant number to be aware of. Um, I'm not going to show this video uh, just because I want to make sure that we have time to get to questions. Um, and this statistic is actually from um, a couple of years ago, but I, I couldn't invent the video in a new slide, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but that video is important because in California, uh, we saw huge increases in their prison population. They were one of the first states to pass a lot of punitive laws, three strikes laws, truth and sentencing laws that kept people in prison. Um, for much longer for violent crimes. And in this video, um, it, it, it illustrates how crowded the prison system was in California a few years ago. You all might have studied um, the La Plata case. It's in some of your classes. So there's um, a Supreme Court case in California that actually ordered the California Department of Corrections to reduce the number of people in their state prisons because there were people triple bumped um, in gyms, you know, big gymnasium-like rooms in prisons in California, and they were so overcrowded that um, you know they had to, to build triple bunks for individuals. For those of you who are interested, you can read up on how California implemented this order, and what they ended up doing was sending a lot of those people to their local jails, which was also problematic because local jails don't have the programming and the rehabilitation classes that people who are incarcerated often need and could benefit from before they're released. So why care about mass incarceration? Um, would love some of you just to throw out some responses. Yes. Most people incarcerated are U.S. citizens and humans. Okay. Because a lot of people are nonviolent offenders and once they're convicted of felonies, they're pretty much untouchables in society. So it's expensive. We, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Any other reasons to care about mass incarceration? Yes. Felons can't vote. Okay, and in many states in this country, if you're released from prison um, or you have a felony conviction, even if you never spent any time in jail or prison, uh, you're, you often are not allowed to vote. So that's called a collateral consequence to um, having a, a conviction. Yes? It's just a horrible environment to be in. Like some people give back waste from the prisons. Yeah, so prisons and jails are horrible environments because of the conditions of confinement. 
They're often broken toilets, no hot water, no soap. Uh, mass incarceration disrupts families and communities by breaking them apart. Okay, excellent point. Mass incarceration disrupts families, communities, people who are in jail or prison can't provide for their families, take their children to school. Yes. Emphasizing mass incarceration uh, very heavily focuses on punishment instead of reformation. Yeah, that is an incredibly important point. We um, are a very punitive society. And when we talk about crime and punishment in the United States, there traditionally hasn't been a big emphasis on rehabilitation. It's, it's often about what we call retribution and punishment. Any other? Yes. Um, population representation is disproportionate for a lot of underrepresented communities. So that is an incredibly important point. Um, the U.S. Has, inc has very significant racial disparities when it comes to who is in our prisons and our jails. Um, black Americans and Latino Americans are disproportionately represented in our jails and our prisons. And right now at the Brennan Center, we're uh, undergoing a project looking at who is in our jails and misdemeanor populations. And New York City, for example, has significantly reduced the number of people in its jail population, but the racial disparities have not moved, despite those significant reductions. So, you know, everything you all said is represented here. Um, and, you know, that $80 billion a year on corrections that the U.S. spends is uh, conservative estimates. Um, and it doesn't actually take into consideration some costs that were just too difficult to, um, to track down. So I don't want to spend too long on this slide because uh, you know this would take hours and there are books written about why the US is so punitive, why we incarcerate so many people. Um, but over the last four to five decades, um, the United States has really doubled down on punitive responses to social harms, to disorder. Again, California sort of led the way. States, you know, there was this domino effect, and states across the country passed laws that incarcerated more people and for longer periods of time. So if you look at the drivers of prison populations, it's who goes in and how long they stay. And the United States um, really focused on incarcerating more people and for much longer periods of time. I don't know if you all have studied the 1994 crime bill yet. Um, the 1994 crime bill was signed by uh, President Bill Clinton. It did a lot of good things, like um, including the Violence Against Women's Act. Um, but it also included this provision that sent money to states if they passed or had on the books already laws that um, kept people in prison if they had committed violent crimes for 85% of their sentences. So states were given money to actually build more beds in their prisons. Um, so that, that bill, that legislation, illustrates a lot of the federal funding that went to states to become more punitive to enforce our criminal laws um, more significantly. Um, so this is just like a quick primer on some of the important statistics related to America's um, prison system and jail system. And many people aren't aware that there are for-profit firms that contract with the government to operate and often own prisons and jails. And I wrote this book, Inside Private Prisons, um, and we have lots of copies for any students who would like them. And there are other copies at the law school if you'd like, if you if you'd like to read it but don't want to carry a book home with you today. Um, I undertook this research because I had studied mass incarceration and I worked on policy to reduce unnecessary incarceration and was always struck by these contracts and how quickly the United States delegated the authority to manage prison populations to these firms. So the book is, an, is a study on how the United States started to contract with these firms 
and really looked at how these contracts came to be. So in the 1970s and 1980s, there were a significant number of State Department of Corrections that were under federal court order to reduce the number of people in their prisons because of overcrowding, because of inhumane conditions. And at the time, it was very difficult to raise taxes to build new prisons. Department of Corrections didn't have the money or the staff to necessarily build and staff these new prisons. So this new industry was born, and these entrepreneurs got together and said, you know what, the government's doing a lousy job. No one can argue with that, of running their prisons. Um, we can do a better job. And we started to see, um, for the first time in the United States, private prisons entering this market. And a lot of people say, well, does it matter who is running a prison? A prison is a prison. Does it matter if the government's running a prison? Um, does it matter if a private firm is running a prison? So we'd love to get your thoughts, sort of, um, I imagine many of you have read articles or seen Orange is the New Black and may have ideas about what the private prison industry is. Um, so we'd love to get your thoughts about whether you think um, this industry should be involved in managing prisons in the United States. Yes? I don't think they should. Why? Because their main, um, their main goal is to make money. Their main, um, their main um, interest is to their shareholders in most cases. And you have things where you know people are being charged outrageous prices for aspirin, lack of medical care. OK. Uh, yes. For companies that are profiting off of the number of people in their facilities, it creates an incentive to um, not provide any programming for rehabilitation and increased recidivism because every person that comes back is more money for the profit. So that's a really important point. I want everyone to remember this point. So you're talking about the incentives. Right. And that if people are released, the corporations managing these prisons have no incentive to make sure those people don't return. Okay. Now, recidivism rates are very high in the United States. So recidivism means it's defined differently by different states, but it tends to mean, um, it tends to be defined by someone returning to prison within three years. Um, does anyone else have any ideas about why private prison should or should not be involved in corrections? Yes. Kind of off that, um, a corporation that has like an incentive to lobby for strict and more punitive laws that will increase the populations that will come into the private. Incredibly important point, um, lobbying. So a couple of years ago when I was doing research for the book, all the websites of all the corporations that manage prisons um, had language on their websites that indicated they do not lobby, they just educate policymakers. So um, they claim they don't, but we can all you know, disagree about the nomenclature. Uh, yes? I think obviously it depends on like what numbers you think are important. Like if you think that running prisons on the cheap is good, then maybe private prisons are okay. But if you think that prisons are meant to rehabilitate people and help people, then maybe not. Okay, so that's an excellent point. A lot of what you all threw out here is on this slide. So writing this book, I discovered that American, the American experiment with private prisons has largely failed. The, in, the industry is simply not transparent, um, and their operating contracts don't often hold them accountable. There's also little evidence that they produce better outcomes than government-run prisons, and that's really important. And a lot of the book focuses, uh, focuses on how the government never held these corporations' feet to the fire in these contracts. And they never said, you know, we're not doing a great job. Our recidivism rates are 40, 50, 60 percent. There's some states, by the way, where they re incarcerate 60 percent of the people in their state prison system are there for violation of a technical um, 
of a technical violation of their condition of confinement, so missing drug treatment, not checking in with their probation officer. So the book asks the question, is it fair to ask the private se sector to succeed where public prisons have clearly failed? If the government can't do a good job, can we even ask the private sector to do a better job? But given the social and economic cost of incarceration, it's time that we find a better way to structure these contracts with the private sector. And this book ultimately explores the impact of the for-profit prison industry and asks what the industry's flaws are and whether they can be fixed. Now I need to pause there for a second because I acknowledge that even asking these questions has worrying moral ramifications. If as a matter of principle it's wrong to profit from punishment, anything short of abolition, including proposing important reforms, does risk complicity with what some would call an indefensible industry. But in the meantime, tens of thousands of people in the United States and throughout the world are incarcerated in facilities owned, operated by for-profit firms. And other countries have begun to, to innovate with these contracts and ask things of for-profit firms that departments of corrections in the United States have never asked the for-profit firms in the U.S. to do. And a lot of the shift in these contracts overseas is about incentives and recidivism. So we just chatted about how there are some contracts that are thinking about privatization a little bit different. And as I was doing research for this book, I learned about contracts in New Zealand and Australia that demand a better performance, innovation, and recidivism reduction. Now, private prisons exist around the globe, not just in the United States. England, Wales, and Australia house more than 18% of their prison population in private prisons. Scotland houses about 15% of their prison population at these facilities. Um, New Zealand and Australia are home to some of the world's fastest growing prison populations. Australia has, um, or right before COVID, had about um, more than 40,000 people behind bars which was a 50% increase in the previous decade. New Zealand's prison population reached an all-time high of 10,600 people in 2018, but it has decreased to about 8,000 people this year. And these skyrocketing numbers have led private prison operators to these countries seeking new opportunities. Australia started the contract with private prisons in the mid-1990s. And today, um, you know, I had just mentioned that they house more than 18% of their incarcerated people in private prisons. Additionally, all of Australia's immigration detention centers are managed by for-profit firms. And New Zealand has turned to the private prison industry more recently than Australia, with its first private prison operating in the year 2000. So to learn more about these prisons overseas. Uh, once the book was published, I applied for a grant with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and was thrilled that they um, accepted my application and funded me to visit Australia and New Zealand to learn more about these new contracts. Um, the grant covered, covered my travels and allowed me to visit these facilities and meet with people on the ground in both countries. In conducting the research, I also spoke to dozens of people involved in the construction and operation of these prisons on the telephone before I visited and when I returned to the States. Re reviewed voluminous contracts. You know, one of the contracts is you know, about this high. Um, learned about key performance indicators, abatements, and spoke to people who were incarcerated in both of these facilities. Um, and again, I'm here today because of the Boulder Center and just really want to thank them for that opportunity because I wouldn't have been able to travel uh, to those countries without that grant.
So just quickly, what are public-private partnerships? So in New Zealand and Australia, these new contracts are considered public-private partnerships. And in New Zealand, this contract with the um, prison in Auckland was the country's first ever public-private partnership. So public-private partnerships um, allow the government to use private sector capital um, and leverage those dollars to improve infrastructure, programming, upgrade facilities. And one of the main advantages of this model is the reduction of financial pressure on the state. Um, and oftentimes, the private sector um, will, will claim, um, usually rightly so, that the time of execution can be reduced just because there's not complicated government procurement, red tape. Um, so sometimes the private sector can uh, manage infrastructure projects more efficiently and more quickly than the government can. In terms of New Zealand, um, so this shows you the change in prison population in New Zealand from 2000 to 2020. So you can see it did peak in 2018 and has been reduced slightly. Um, and this is a illustration of the male population versus the female population um, in prisons in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand has an incredibly low female population. Most of the people who are in prison in New Zealand are men. Um, and it's also important to understand uh, some of the perspective and context. So New Zealand's resident population, so the, the, the country's population is a little more than 5 million people, uh, whereas the US has 332 million people living in our country. And so when you see these low numbers, it does reflect as well a lower um, population in the country. New Zealand has 18 prisons. The United States has more than 1,500 state prisons and more than 100 federal prisons for a total of more than 1,600 prisons. You're having six, 1,600 plus prisons in the U.S. versus about 18 in New Zealand. And those are just prisons in the U.S. Those are not local jails. Uh, this indicates the... Um, the offenses for who is in prison in New Zealand, and this is from the New Zealand Department of Corrections website. Um, you can see about 22% of people are there for sexual assault, um, and, and you can read about the, the different charges there. And we were discussing racial disparities in the U.S. Um, this is a really important uh, visualization, and the New Zealand significantly struggles with racial disparities in its prison population, and this is evident by an overrepresentation of more people um, in their justice system. Uh, so their indigenous population is half, a little more than half of the number of people who are imprisoned in New Zealand. And to put this in context, uh, the Maori people make up only about 15% of the country's population, but represent half of the people who are incarcerated. And this chart has not changed over the years. It's remained stubbornly high. So this is 2009, and this is 2022. Um, so in fact, the racial disparities have increased. So I visited the Auckland um, South Corrections facility um, a couple of years ago, and the facility had just been built. Um, it represented, as I mentioned before, the first public-private partnership for any infrastructure projects that New Zealand had ever engaged in. And the contract was worth studying, I thought because it required massive penalties if the, the for-profit firm, which is Serco, um, 
violated any contractual provisions, such as escapes, thefts, and custody, but it would reward the company through a financial bonus for reducing the number of people who left that prison and ultimately didn't return behind bars within two years. So this is a contract that we don't see in the United States. So I was curious also, how did they come up with these bonus numbers? Um, and I spoke to folks at the Department of Treasury on the telephone, and they said that it represented how much they thought not having another person in the prison system could save. And they translated that into a dollar sum for the bonus. Um, and I was very curious, what does it mean to conceptualize a contract squarely from the point of reducing recidivism? And the folks I talked to at the Department of Treasury in New Zealand said they assumed everything the government corrections did in the past just didn't work ex exceptionally well. So they really tried to innovate when it came to this contract. So this is... Um, before you sort of drive up to that facility, again, it's in Auckland, New Zealand. Though the contract was and is quite complex, the core principle is simple. Allow the private sector to innovate to reach a public policy outcome, which is reducing recidivism. If these private, they're called consortiums, so it was a construction company, a private prison operator, um, if they do better than government-run prisons, they receive these annual bonuses. And specifically, Serco would earn a bonus of up to $1.5 million a year if the individuals who are released from this facility, um, what they say reoffend, but we, we can think of it as are not returned to prison, um, at least 10 to 15 percent below people who are released from government run facilities. So, who's in this consortium? Um, in New Zealand, it's the Department of Corrections, um, and then this Secure Future, which represents the private industry. Um, and so these are all the players who are at the table um, as part of this contract. And the private firm, Serco, manages the prison, and the employees all work for Serco. So this is the the prison, um, and this here is actually the, the visitor center there. I'm just going to talk about some of the things that are a little bit subtle um, in terms of this prison. So there's this visitor center um, where when you walk up to it, you can actually see inside um, when you're walking up to the prison. And it was built that way because a lot of children are visiting um, their, their loved ones, their fathers, their uncles, their cousins or grandfathers in this prison, and um, research indicates that as children walk up to these facilities, if they can see inside, um, their stress levels are reduced. Um, each of the prison cells contain a computer and a telephone. So if some of you have been in prisons in the U.S., uh, it's very, very rare to have a computer in a prison, almost unheard of, unless it's a very specific type of unit. Um, almost unheard of to have a telephone. Uh, there's a, tel a television in each cell that doubles as a computer screen with a keyboard and a mouse. Um, the incarcerated people can use these computers to arrange family visits, medical appointments, and manage their daily schedule. Walking around the grounds uh, with the prisoner, um, the prison's director, Mike Inglis, I was struck by the humanizing elements of the prison that utilize what's called a progression-regression approach um, that incentivizes the men who are incarcerated to earn their way towards living in six-room cottages where they cook for themselves, they have knives, they have cooking utensils that in most prisons in the U.S. would be deemed as weapons. You can't have a knife in almost any jail or prison in the U.S. They do their own laundry. Um, I spoke to Maury Mann, who had completed educational and educational <coughs> programs and progressed from living in more traditional prison cells to living in these six-room cottages 
I walked into one of these cottages, um, and these residences, these cottages, are home to about 25% of the prison population at this prison. They resemble dorm rooms with desks. Um, there's a, a suite in the middle um, with television, uh, couches, windows without bars, microwaves, refrigerator, cooking utensils. Um, and this is really important because these accommodations aim to normalize incarcerated um, incarcerated people's experience in these prisons um, so that they, they have a better understanding of what it is like to live outside these prison walls. Um, they operate their own laundry, they cook their own meals, and even for those who live in more conventional cells, they manage their own affairs through this computer system with their own medical appointments. Um, and this is another picture of the facility. You can see it was created with sort of a campus style um, goal. And again, this facility was created. Um, it was a new facility and it was created around this public private partnership with the goal of rehabilitating the individuals inside. Um, the prison also partners with placemakers, a construction firm that accepts men from the prison on work release. They get paid the same wages as non-incarcerated um, fellow workers. And when I was there, so you know, they had hired 12 men already who been released from the prison. Um, they also have a they train incarcerated people that read baristas and have a um, cafe actually at the facility. Um, and this is a um, cultural center for the Maori men who are in the facility. And the contract um, is twofold. So CERCO is paid for reducing recidivism in general, but they're also paid if they can specifically reduce recidivism for the Maori men in this facility at a greater rate than the government is able to. So aiming to reduce the recidivism of Maori, CERCO and its partners work with indigenous groups to design and build a cultural center um, for the prison's large Maori population. And some of Auckland's, of this prison's practices are being adopted by other prisons throughout New Zealand. Uh, the design of the visitor center has been replicated at government run, at government run prison, and there's talk of creating cottages at other facilities as well. Um, I sat down with Jeremy Lightfoot, who was the deputy chief executive of the New Zealand Department of Corrections at the time. Um, and I, I said to him, uh, he was very honest with me, and I was in his office, and I said, you know, in the United States, this would be very threatening to have a private prison that is supposed to, you know, beat the recidivism of the government facility. You know, what is it like for you? And he sort of looked at me and was shocked that I even asked the question. He said, but it's, it's in our network if this prison is succeeding, we're succeeding. Um, you know, the, the philosophy is based on the idea that these public-private partnerships can drag the government prisons up. Um, and if the private prisons are doing something more innovative, the public prisons need to follow their lead. So that, I think, is really, really important, um, given that's just not how we work with for-profit firms in the U.S., you know, it would be would make every correctional director in the United States look terrible, right, if the private prisons started saying, well, our recidivism rate is so much better than yours. So I want to stop soon so I can, I can answer your questions, but I think it's really important to discuss are these attempts enough. And in early 2019, um, the New Zealand Chief Ombudsman Office released a report about the prison um, that I had visited. And monitors had inspected it around the same time frame that I was in this prison. And in the report, they stated um, that they were particularly concerned by the prison's reliance on locking individuals in their cells to manage staff shortages. Um, so people were being locked in their cells far too often than um, they should have been. We're not getting outside, and we're not getting right, the exercise that they have designed this facility around. Um, 
The Ombudsman report also found that the record keeping of the facility um, needed to improve and paperwork related to use of force incidents needed to be improved. Despite some findings in the Ombudsman report about things that really need to be improved um, in the condition in the um, prison. And, and the Ombudsman in New Zealand is not working for CERCO, right? The Ombudsman is an independent agency and they focus on um, on human rights issues in the prisons across the country. Um, but the bonus clauses are triggered when the company outperforms publicly run prisons, sort of despite um, independent monitoring reports of the prison. And Serco did receive a bonus for reducing recidivism at a greater rate for both Mori individuals and non-Mori individuals in that prison. I have done research. I will be honest with you. I don't know if they've received a second bonus, and it might be because of COVID and potentially some um, slowdowns in programming, but I don't know that for a fact. So Circo was paid this bonus. And I think, oops, oh, you told me not, not to push that button. Okay. Um, so there are skeptics who have doubts that these prisons go far enough to accommodate the needs of indigenous people, to accommodate the needs of non-indigenous people. And I spoke to Elizabeth Grant, who's a professor of architecture at the University of um, Canberra, I hope I pronounced it right. She said the massive overrepresentation of indigenous people in Australia and Maori and Pacific Islanders in the New Zealand prison systems is catastrophic, with the system continuing, continuing the devastating process of colonization. She told me that Eurocentric prison systems continue to fail indigenous people. So even if these models show some promise, it's important to remember that recidivism rates are merely one metric and don't reveal a whole lot about someone's ability to thrive in the community once they're released. Equally, we can't forget that by the time individuals have reached these prison gates, many of them arrived because of failures in their community far before they were incarcerated due to the failure of of the government's ability to provide resources to combat intergenerational poverty, systemic racism, and a lack of education and other social services. So despite the immense work that lies ahead to truly transform criminal justice systems across the globe and ensure less people end up in prison, it is important to study some of the more humanizing elements that are present at these prisons if they can be replicated elsewhere so that those who do find themselves behind bars are treated more humanely and with human dignity. So I will leave you on that note. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of students I speak to will ask, um, you know, shouldn't we be abolishing prison? Shouldn't we be abolishing these contracts? And this research really focuses on the sort of practical nature that in the United States we have um, contracts with private prisons. We're not going to eliminate them tomorrow, next year, probably even within the next decade. So why would we not ask the private sector to do more? Why would we not say to them, you know, let's tear up your contracts and focus on ensuring that the people who leave your prison are not ever going to return? to the Department of Corrections. And so that's what some of this research was about. I will stop there and happy to answer any questions. Yes. Do you know, do they allow all types of offenders or like nonviolent offenders are not eligible with this type of campus? It is a um, a fairly secure prison, um, and again, because of COVID, a lot changed in terms of who's in some of these prisons. I know in the Australia prison, which I did talk about, which was also um, a public-private partnership, uh, they have more pretrial people than the contracts ever imagined, and so they're having a harder time with with figuring out sort of key performance indicators around recidivism reduction because of who changed in terms of who's in the prison. But there are some very significant 
people who committed violent crimes in this prison. Yes? I'm thinking that if we ever had moved to a prison system that resembled the ones that you showed us, there would be such an outrage. Um, I think it'd be used as political thought or particularly by um, the right to say, oh, this is better than how so many people live. So my question is, practically, what do we do in this country to achieve something where at least come even close to what other countries are, or how other countries are progressing? So that's a great question. For those who couldn't hear, the question is, how do we, how do we guard against people saying, well, this is, these are too nice, um, you know, politically, how do we advocate for better living conditions, human dignity? And that's, that's the key question. Um, we're doing a lot of thinking about that at the Brennan Center. You know, if you visit uh, prisons in Norway, Germany, Finland, um, Scandinavian countries, their focus is human, di human dignity, humanity, normalization. And the communities understand that these prisons are part of their community. And in a lot of those prisons, people may ride their bike from the prison to go to a job, and they have a key to their cells in some of these facilities. Um, I actually taught a class to some New York City Corrections uh, officers in New York, and we were showing them slides of those prisons, and some of them were laughing. I mean, they couldn't imagine a system like that in the United States. So one answer to your question is culture change, and culture change is really, really hard. How do you change culture both with corrections <coughs> officers who have never been trained around human dignity, around normalization? In the United States, all of the um, your corrections officers are trained around security, and it is all about ensuring there's no escapes, there's no violence, there's no assaults. In a lot of these Northern European countries, um, corrections officers have tremendous education. The state pays for that education, and um, they're very respectable jobs in civil service. In the United States, corrections officers do not get paid a lot. They are not considered you know, um, elite jobs. And the staff shortages in the United States are awful. In New York City, where I live, you know, Rikers Island has 25% of the correctional officers are calling out sick every day. Ooh. And this is common all across the country, especially with COVID. People don't want to report to work, which is understandable given the conditions of confinement in our prisons and our jails. That is an important question, a big question, and I think you all, as future leaders and advocates, um, can play a big role in writing about the need to normalize these conditions. 95% um, of people who are incarcerated will be released. And we're doing our own communities a disservice by not providing adequate health care, um, job training, mental health services, drug treatment to the people in our prisons. I mean, there are waiting lists in almost every prison in America to, um, to join programs. So. Uh, Albie, I think yes. you're going to lose some students in a minute. Can yes. you take one minute and talk about internships and fellowships? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I had said I would. So I know a lot of you are thinking about summer internships and jobs post law school. Um, and many of you are thinking about government and public interest roles. So the Brennan Center for Justice does hire law students for summer, fall, and spring internships. Uh, so please do look for, for internships if you're interested in working for a public policy organization. I work in our justice program, but most of the people at the organization focus on voting rights. Um, we have a team that focuses on redistricting, gerrymandering, money in politics, liberty, national security. So I would urge all of you to look on our website. We hire um, summer, fall, and spring legal interns. and. We also tend, we can work with students who are interested in fellowships post law school. It's always changing in terms of what fellowships are available, but in the past we've worked with students who have applied to EJW um, and many other fellowships. So do think of us if you're thinking about a fellowship opportunity post law school. Um, you can always contact me, email me, I'll put you in touch with the right person at the Brennan Center. Um, and, and we've right. still got a few more minutes, I just yes. wanted you to hear that before you yeah. make some more questions. Uh, yes. Yes. 
Um, so I know like a huge, huge proponent and part of mass incarceration in the United States and private prisons and bed quotas as part of the contract. Do you know like if there are any, what they look like in the partnerships in New Zealand as far as like we promise that we'll fill X percentage of your beds? That's an excellent question. And so the question is about bed quotas. And in a lot of prisons in the U.S. and immigration detention centers as well, there are quotas um, to reduce bed quotas. And what that translates into in practicality is that the prisons are uh, paid sort of for, for um, a guaranteed bed payment. So at one point, the Dilly um, Family Detention Center in Texas I, I don't know if the contract is still structured that way, but um, originally the, co the company course of it was paid um, a guaranteed rate, no matter how many people were inside the facility. Um, we at the Reddit Center have argued that that's a waste of government resources and we shouldn't be spending money on empty beds, um, and it doesn't incentivize closing the facility. The, the private operators will argue, well, it costs a set amount to operate the facility anyway, and they'll lose money if they don't have that contract. So those are sort of the two sides of the issue. Um, in terms of these contracts, that's a really good question. I, I didn't run into any um, guaranteed payments, um, but again, these contracts have changed, and not every there's some things that are sort of not public about all of the contracting between the um, government and the private operator. But that is a, a good question. Yes? Um, I was wondering, so I feel like a lot of times it's easier in ways, or there's more mechanisms to hold like a government-run facility accountable. So with a private-run facility and wanting to get them to make these changes and wanting to do these things, like what are kind of mechanisms to actually hold them accountable? So that's an excellent question about accountability, and um, the government is required to comply with certain open records requests, both at the state level and the federal level. Because these firms are private contractors in the U.S., they are not always held as accountable as the government-run facilities are, because government contractors um, sometimes do not have to respond the same way to the government that the government does to open records requests. The other problem with these contracts is that there's information that the firms say is proprietary information. These are private sector actors. And you know, they may say, well, the number of corrections officers we have on the floor this day is proprietary information. Um, and so that's why it's a little bit harder to hold them accountable. Um, oftentimes, honestly, with government record requests anyway, I don't know if you all have filed any or seen any, but you know, half of what you request is redacted. Um, that tends to be what happens with um, requesting information from these um, for-profit firms as well. So this contract mechanism in New Zealand and Australia is a way to hold them accountable through the philosophy of what they're trying to do, right? Which is, your goal is to reduce recidivism. So what they've done is they've, you know, and in Australia, um, at Raven Hall, there's a similar contract, and they're engaged with the YMCA and you know job placement in in Australia and in New Zealand. You know, I mentioned placemakers. Do these these partnerships that these consortiums are creating with um, with uh, organizations, companies that can employ incarcerated people is a way to hold them accountable and say, make sure that these people are returned to their community with jobs, with a way to earn a living wage. So. Okay, I think they have the full schedule for, for LB. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you feeling about questions? Oh, I can ask a few. Yeah, I mean, I, I can do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how about a couple more and then we'll give them a Sure, you sure. Uh, yeah, okay. I know that in New Zealand, in uh, other parts of the world, they're emphasizing um, or making everything that they can bilingual. Within these prisons, how much the emphasis is there on that? How successful are they in getting 
staff that he's keeping That's an excellent question, and I am not sure what the answer to that in terms of bilingual staff. There are some corrections officers who, you know, are bilingual and some who aren't. The problem is that there are staff shortages all across the world when it comes to corrections and even getting enough people to work at these facilities is really difficult. So ensuring that they're bilingual and have certain educational requirements is, is really tough. Um, aspirational, but... Right, last yes. question. Yes. Uh, so, as President Johnson mentioned at the beginning of this session, cost is a big issue with prisons, and so one of the kind of unifying forces for doing something about prisons is bring costs down. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you have any kind of comparative like, data on cost per prisoner in dealing with the system versus what we spend in, in the U.S. that would potentially incentivize us to move more towards that model. So that's an excellent question about cost, and I hesitate to even answer that because we're talking about such different systems, and when you even when you look at costs in the U.S., there's marginal costs, there's average costs, and a lot of the cost estimates are, are problematic for sort of a lot of different reasons. One other reason why, and it's an excellent question, um, and something that we talk about a lot with mass incarceration, and Michelle Alexander said it best, I, I heard her speak a few years ago, many years ago, and you know, many of us advocates researchers when we're speaking to policymakers and we're speaking, you know, I spoke about the cost rate, right, the, the 80 billion. Um, and Michelle Alexander said it best, she said, by only focusing on these costs, we risk the, um, we risk one day saying, well, we can afford mass incarceration. And I still talk about costs. But I just think moving forward, um, we should really, you know, it may, it may actually cost more to run a smaller, more streamlined correctional system with fewer prisons and jails in the U.S. than we're spending now. But if we're treating the people humanely and giving them proper programming, um, that might be what it takes. And so it's just, a, you know, when we're thinking about costs, it is important to understand many of us talk about the cost because we feel like this criminal justice system in the U.S. is not working, that our prison system is, is a failure and we're spending more than $80 billion a year on it. Um, but an excellent question on the costs are obviously important because these firms are getting bonuses for reducing recidivism. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.